Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this month's uh, CMP webinar. Um, my name is Bob Christensen. I'm going to be your uh, moderator this evening, and uh, we're lucky to have uh, a CMP uh, board member here with us tonight, advisory board member Jonah Berger, and um, he's going to be uh, talking about dancing to a different beat of the drum, meeting the challenge of life with CMP, uh, which we could all probably use a little help with. Um, as we go through the presentation, Joe is not going to have slides for you, so you see his picture there, and we're just going to keep that up as is, and um, he'll be speaking for about uh, 40, 45 minutes. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to type them in the, uh, the question window there on your screen. It's on the right-hand side in the bar, and uh, we'll either get to them at the end, or if they pertain to something that's happening as Joe is talking, we'll, uh, we'll you know, jump right in and ask John if he can, uh, he can uh, help us out with an answer right there. And having said that, um, if you have any questions technical during the uh, presentation, you can also put them in the question window or uh, ping me in the chat window, and uh, I'll get back to you as quickly as I can, as I'll be monitoring all of those. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn over to Jonah and uh, enjoy yourself. Jonah? I'm here. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, from balmy Denver, Colorado, it was 63 degrees here today, and we're supposed to have seven inches of snow by Saturday, so welcome to the madness that is that. All is well with the world, though. I am sitting in a house I bought a few months ago with my new wife of only a couple months. Um, Banjo, my adorable Poochie, is asleep next to me on the couch, and on my um, television I have that uh, fireplace uh, DVD playing. So it's a very calm Denver evening and I couldn't be more honored and more delighted to be with you guys. Um, I will give a couple kind of caveats uh, before I jump on into it all. Um, first of all is just to encourage you to participate, to ask your questions. If there's anything I'm saying that spawns a question, if there are any questions you have for me, um, please throw them out there. Uh, Bob and I agreed, as he just said, if it's something that's pertinent to that moment, by all means, I'll be happy to be interrupted and answer questions, but please trust that we'll leave at least 15 minutes at the end for you guys to, uh, for me to go through your questions and address them specifically. So. Uh, let's be a group about this. And um, the other thing I would say just before I get started is I always say this, I'm going to be myself, which means I am not going to be putting on my webinar voice and trying to be a radio personality because I am not. I am a talkative Jewish man who is a touch disheveled at times but has a lot um, in my heart, especially with regards to CMT to share, so <clears throat> let's all um, let's all relax out of official webinar mode and just hang out together on this fine Thursday night, my favorite night of the week, by the way, um, because the weekend is almost here, but it's not here yet, and I just love that feeling. So Thursday has always been my my day. Uh, let us begin with a quick story, and I will acknowledge up front that it is not an exciting story. But it is, in my opinion, very pertinent to what it is we're talking about tonight. Uh, this past summer in August, <clears throat> we had our first ever um, summer camp for youth with CMT. It's called Camp Footprint, and it was a magic week, to say the least. And just to walk around every day and see kids who balance is such an issue for them and youth who usually struggle for very basic tasks in life, zip lining and wall climbing and taking a hike through the woods at night without flashlights. I was part of it and it was unbelievable. As scary as it sounds and just as awesome. Um, and yet, in kind of reflecting on the week and what I wanted to share with you guys tonight about it, I would say that it wasn't any of those big feats that really stands out as, as one of the best moments of the week. The best moment of the week for me came on the second or third morning. Um, I came out of my room 
all the guys, all the males were staying in one cabin, the females were in another, and so I was in the male cabin and came out of my room and came into the common area where there were several couches and comfy chairs and everyone's kind of getting started with their day and as I do at home, I brought my braces out in my hands and sat down and started to put on my braces and I sat down on one of the couches on one end and I'm starting to put on my left brace and as I'm putting on my right brace my head tilts to the right and I notice that there are two other campers sitting next to me doing the exact same thing and I don't I know it's not a profound thing for the average person to hear but as many of you can understand it, I don't know why for me it was the moment of the week it really was because every day of my life I get up and I'm the only one putting on braces I'm the only one who understands what it's like to not just fly on your shoes and bust out the door but to sit down and start the whole process which doesn't take forever but takes a lot longer than just putting on a simple pair of shoes um, and to see two other people doing it with the greatest of ease next to me was just so awesome it was comforting and it was the theme of the week is that things that all of us the youth and the staff we're used to doing on our own and being the only one that has to go through that. Suddenly for a whole week we were surrounded by people who were doing those things, surrounded by people who were struggling with fine motor skills, surrounded by people who needed some extra support with balance, uh, and surrounded by people who before they take their first number of steps in the morning have to sit down and put on their braces. And that to me was awesome. Why was it awesome is kind of the point of this story. It was awesome because other people understood what was going on. I just knew without having to say a word, none of us on the couch spoke to each other, that they got it, that they understood. It was awesome. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight is around the topic of sharing the experience of CMT with those around you, especially those who don't have CMT because it is, in my experience and in my absolute opinion, the number one way to make your own path more comfortable. It is hard, challenging, and awkward at times to share it with people who don't get it. Um, but the result, the product of that is profound. And I just really want to speak a bunch about that tonight and help you all to hopefully be inspired to do more of that than you're already doing. Um, camp was a week of swimming in the delights of being surrounded by people who understood. And I, I guess my point is you don't have to go to a CMT camp to get that. You can create that in your world and at your office and in your circle of friends and with your family by sharing the experience, by informing them, by getting them caught up to what it feels like to have CMT and thereby surrounding yourself with people who know so that your day-to-day -day can feel as comfortable instead of awkward as it did on that couch that morning. Um, a little bit about me for those of you who don't know me. My name is Jonah Berger. I am 44 years old. I live in Denver, Colorado. I run a business called The Rhythm Within. I work with kids and adults with all kinds of special needs. Um, I do one-on-one -on -one mentorship with those clients, helping with social skills, with employment skills. Um, with community access and independence skills. I also teach several classes uh, for young adults with high functioning autism to get them ready for the work world. And I do a drumming program in schools and with groups um, about special needs, sharing my special needs, asking what are their special needs, and doing percussion around that. Um, I also have the absolute delight to be on the advisory board for the CMTA. Um, I am a co-director for the for Camp Footprint as I was just talking about and again I guess to be repetitive really just very honored to be here tonight um, my family uh, has CMT on my mom's side we have CMT X so it is on our X chromosome my mom's mother had it my mother and two of her three sisters have it and out of the nine kids um, that those four girls had, three of us out of the nine have CMT. I do not have children um, as of yet. I don't know if my mom's listening, but uh, no children yet, mom. You'll be the first to know. Um, but I am married to an amazing, amazing girl named Megan and um, happy 
unbelievably happy. Life is going really well these days, um, and hope to share a little of that happiness with you. Uh, I wrote a book um, called He Walks Like a Cowboy. I wrote this book about eight years ago, and it was basically from a friend of mine who had um, challenged me to not just tell stories about what it's like to have a disability, but to write them down, and I did over the course of about eight months. Um, I just wrote whenever the spirit moved me and told stories that uh, kind of got the message across, and it all came together in a book that is called He Walks Like a Cowboy, available on Amazon.com. You just go on to Google and type in He Walks Like a Cowboy or Jonah Berger, and they tend to come up pretty easily. Uh, I'd like to read you a, I think, one of the shortest chapters in the book. It's only two pages, uh, called the title of tonight, Marching to the Beat of My Own Drummer. While the largest affect of CMT occurs in the lower legs, ankles, and feet, the other predominantly affected areas are in the hands and wrists. As a result of the slower brain messaging, the muscles in my wrists and hands are weakened over time. The greatest challenge in regards to what is called fine is in regards to what is called fine motor or the ability to accomplish smaller physical tasks using the fingers. The reason this is tough for me is twofold. One, as a result of CMT, my fingers and toes are slowly curling in, resulting over many years in the loss of, of the loose flexibility of normal digits. In my hands, that is problem number one. The seven Second difficulty has to do with a cluster of muscles located between your thumb and forefinger. This muscle group is responsible for any task that requires your thumb and fingers to work in conjunction. You notice this cluster because on most hands it is represented by a slightly rounded bulge between the thumb and the forefinger on the top of your hand. On my hands, that area is represented by a concave dip, revealing just my skin and the shape of my bones. This has left me with a drastic depletion in my ability to do small things like button a shirt, pick up a penny, or effectively squeeze the lime into my drink. It provides for an interesting irony. I can lift a barbell of 100 pounds, but I can't pick a safety pin off the ground. A few major breakthroughs of leg brace proportion have come in regards to my hands. The smaller of the two is the button hooker. This is not a cute prostitute, no. This is a device that consists of a large, graspable rubber handle and a small metal extended piece. The metal piece is inserted into the whole side of the shirt and then hooks the button allowing me to pull it through the hole. Quite a handy device actually. I see it that way now yet like most of my forms of assistance it was hard for me to embrace them proudly and out of my own sense of pride. From the ages of 15 to 25 as my hands and fingers slowly started to weaken, I continued to button my shirts the way I always had. The weaker I got, the slower the buttoning became, and the greater the number of episodes when I would spend five full minutes working on one small button. Screaming obscenities at the top of my lungs, I am sure that my neighbors back then did not think I was much of a morning person. The grander hand breakthrough came just after college. I was camping with a group of friends and late one evening under the western Maryland sky next to a live campfire, a good friend of mine named Dan offered me a drum to play alongside some of the other fireside instruments that were in full swing. I accepted and sat with the drum between my legs for a while before I started to play along. Before long I found myself in one of those moments life simply unfolds before you, as if I were watching it on a screen with no intentional participation whatsoever. In mere moments, I was caught up in the musical groove before me. I was playing along, and what's more, I was playing in rhythm. I was smiling past the confines of my face in that moment, delighted to discover two previously unknown pieces of my soul within that same moment. One, I had rhythm, a clear and natural inclination towards percussion, and two, I was using my hands to create that rhythm. These weak and suffering hands were in full swing and focused accomplishment. I noticed the joy I was deriving from using my hands in a way that was good and strong and righteous. It felt great. That was 1995, and in the 12 years since, this is when I wrote the book, I have become a drummer, playing casually around many campfires for many friends, using percussion in my work with children over the years, and most proudly, drumming in a folk bluegrass band from 2003 till 2005. I never really attempted or took, a, took to kit drumming, the set style of drums you sit behind and play with sticks. I think holding and grasping the sticks would be too much strain over time. 
That's why I've always enjoyed, oh, that's why I've always stayed partial to hand drumming, using just my hands to beat various Latin and African drums. There are many wonderful gifts that come from drumming, a chance to feel connected to rhythm, a chance to express myself musically, a chance to join a band and play on stage in front of people, the ability to entertain others, the opportunity co to connect to other drummers and musicians, peace, love, and so on. I do think that the most special gift that I have derived from my drumming is the relationship it has caused me to form with my hands. Before drumming, I noticed that I simply didn't want to think about my hands. I didn't want to focus on them. I kept my eyes off of them unless I was forced to. Yet the act of drumming, in a very natural way, brought some much-needed focus back to them. While I was drumming, I would feel proud of my hands. When I was done drumming, I would think of my hands as slightly more rugged. And most especially, I've adopted a unique style of hand drumming, mostly different from the true professionals and from the way it is taught in lessons. You see, true hand drumming requires finesse. After taking several hand drumming lessons, I came to learn that it requires a lot more finesse than one would expect. It requires very delicate ways of forming your hands and shaping them to get just the right tone from the drum and using very precise and varying amounts of force with each hit you make in order to achieve the different tones that any one drum head contains. But finesse is not a word I often associate with CMT. Most things that require true finesse are the things that cause me the most difficulty. While I was taking these lessons, I found that I couldn't shape my hands in the traditional ways that they were preaching. I couldn't use my fingers to achieve various sounds. I naturally ended up with, I naturally ended up with, uh, if you can't finesse them, smack the hell out of them style. I found myself naturally compensating with force for what I could not achieve with finesse. I played my drums loud and hard. I went after the rhythm with a vengeance. And while I had never considered myself to be all that great of a drummer, I found that those I played for enjoyed my groove and as a result of and as a result of its difference. I think they pick up on my intensity, and it is contagious. I have over time explored ways to work within the style to achieve the common tones in my uncommon ways. I am not able to get it all yet, but I do find that I have learned to hold my own. When I watch a traditional hand drummer play, it amazes me. It is very different than the way I play, and it reassures me of the accomplishment that my hands have figured out their own way to play. Nice going, boys. This part of my path has taught me one of the most important and common lessons to those with physical challenges. In most cases, you will be able to accomplish whatever you wish. The trick is understanding that you may have to accomplish them in very different ways than other people. Accepting that, is the that it's the destination that matters, not how you arrive there. I use a button hooker as most people use their fingers to button up their shirts. I use my two pointer fingers to pick up small items as most people use their finger and thumb. It amazes me just how much precious energy I have spent over the years struggling with tasks that could have quite easily been accomplished by the swallowing of pride and by the accepting of difference. The more I focus my attention on the best way to get things done as opposed to the most normal way, the easier life becomes. Simple as that and the beat goes on. So I guess that chapter really kind of helps set that stage of it's how you do it that matters. It's not how close to the way others do it that matters, and it's taken me a long, long time to learn that, um, but I have finally learned it. In regards to the way that I see my disability and the positive attitude that I have around it, I think that I have spent my entire life cultivating it, but I am fully aware, fully aware that it all really resorts back to my mother and the way that she taught me. I say in the book, it, it wasn't as much sitting me down and saying, here's how you need to deal with your disability. She taught me without ever saying a word. She taught me with action. And the action was that she was probably busier than any mother I knew. All my friends' moms paled in comparison. And my mom was dealing with a physical disability. She never ever let it stop her. She never let it slow her down and she never ever missed the opportunity to teach someone through her challenge. Anyone looked at her funny or asked her about it, she would grab the opportunity and teach them. And I noticed this and it set me on my way. Um, let me show you a quick picture if you look at your screen. There's my sweet mom, Marilyn Berger. She lives in Maryland and she is the best times a million. 
Uh, let's go ahead and leave my mom up there for a while. Um, let's see. A client of mine named Megan, who I work with, who deals with autism, high-functioning autism, but depression as well and, and pretty severe anxiety. We recently got Megan a job at a library because she loves libraries. And just by nature of getting a job at one of the busier libraries in the Denver metro area, she has anxiety attacks from time to time and sometimes she just has to leave the library or she has to go sit down and cry her eyes out just to get it out and then she's okay. For the first six weeks that she worked there, she and I would meet once a week and she would tell me about these episodes when they would happen and she, as she was talking it just occurred to me that most of the struggle was not the actual episode itself, was not the actual anxiety itself, but the guilt and the shame of what others must be thinking by looking at her in those moments. What are they thinking about her? She must look so embarrassing. This was causing her more stress than the original anxiety. So the two of us together came up with an idea that we would create a one-page um, write-up on her disability. Here's what I have. Here's what it looks like with me in my day-to-day. -day, and here's how it will affect me sometimes while I'm at work. She did an amazing job of creating this form with me, and she had the guts to go into her work and talk with her supervisors and ask them to share a copy of it with every employee in the library. And the last uh, line on the bottom of the page, she wrote in all capitals and bolded, I love questions. Please don't be afraid to ask. In the week and a half, almost two weeks since she has done that, it is amazing to see what's happened with her. Her anxiety is lowered because she knows that the people around her know what she's dealing with. Her amazing coworkers have come to her. Half of them have questions about what it's like to have autism or anxiety or depression. The other half have come up to her and just put their arms around her and said, I just want you to know if you ever need anything, let me know. What a beautiful result, but it's very important to acknowledge that the reason that result came about is Megan's courage to get over her fear of sharing it with strangers and letting them know what was up. You inform them, they can then support you instead of make you feel more uncomfortable. I thought that was a pretty impressive thing I wanted to share with you guys. Sa, which is uh, my sister-in-law, her name's Sarah, but um, when my wife was young um, and Sarah was young, they couldn't pronounce Sarah so they ended up calling her Sa and so we still to this day call her Sa. Sarah's got um, CDG, it is a very rare disorder and it has to do with the way that her cells absorb sugar um, in her body but it ends up resulting in a very similar way to cerebral palsy. Sarah is in a wheelchair. Sarah has challenges with speech, challenges with movement, challenges with a lot of things with regards to her body, um, and is quite possibly one of my favorite people on the planet. Um, she's just so delightful, and everyone who comes across her is just falling under her magic spell. She has a way about her. She lifts her arms up in the air as if to say, I'm ready to hug you, and you go in for one of the best hugs you've ever had in your life. Sarah is an example of many people I am lucky to know in my life who doesn't dwell on her difference. She is who she is. She could care less about the difference between her and what is deemed as normal. She just is who she is, and as a result of that fact, people love her. She's so easy to love because she's just herself. And it's a, it's a thing that inspires me to remind all of you, don't ever forget to just be who you are, no matter what that is. Bumps and all, you know. Um, take the example of the Sarahs of the world, the Saws of the world, and really learn to embrace your differences, embrace your challenges, be frustrated by them when you need to, but go on with your life, live your life, be who you are. And as a result, without even trying, Sarah teaches everyone around her. It is the very reason that, in my opinion, I got into work in the special needs community is that my clients, for the most part, are free from the pressures that most of us are locked into every day to be normal, to be like everyone else. It is so exhausting, and they're free of it. 
I love hanging out with my clients because they remind me every day without even trying, without speaking a word that you should just be who you are. And if you accomplish that, you get to smile a lot. You get to let, make other people around you relax a lot. And I've just always thought that was really impressive. Communicating with others is a scary thing. We've made it much scarier over time. The main reason that it's scary is that people don't understand everything. It's scary to talk about our disability with other people. They are scared to broach the topic of disability. Why? Because of ignorance. Not in a negative way. I don't say that as a bad thing. I say that as a factual thing. When people don't know something, when people don't understand something, they fear it. And our culture has made that much bigger. But the one thing our culture seems to have forgotten is that people are born curious. Human beings are curious creatures. We have a natural curiosity in regards to things that we don't understand. Things that are different from the way we know them, we are curious as to what they're all about. That is natural. That is beautiful. And that is great. What is not natural, what is not beautiful, and what is not great is what we have started to do as a culture and as a society, which is to make people afraid to ask, afraid to inquire, afraid to connect with people who have differences. If someone walks past me and they see my braces and I catch them looking down at my braces, they look away very quickly. Oh, no, 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 I wasn't looking at your brace. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, don't be sorry. You were looking at my brace. It's unusual. Look, come right up to me and ask. This is why I've always said that kids get this concept 10,000 times better than adults because the kids I've worked with over the years, when I'm wearing shorts, will come walking right up to me and say, why do you have those things on your legs? And I'll say, well, I was born with a disability that makes my legs weak and my feet are hard to pick up and so these hold my feet up when I walk so I'm not falling down and I let them touch my brace and I knock on the brace and they can see how strong it is and I say do you think anything's gonna hurt my feet when I'm wearing these and they say no way and I say yeah so that's why I wear them and instantly you can literally see the change in their eyes it goes away to them it's as if they no longer see your difference because they understand it they've been given the gift of knowledge Knowledge extinguishes ignorance, and then people can coexist with differences. The reason we have developed so much fear of each other in this world is that we don't understand each other. We just don't understand each other, whether it's race, whether it's religion, whether it's culture, whether it's disability. Um, I guess my long-winded preachy point is talk to people, lead by example. We can turn that culture mistake around by taking the lead in that. We have things about us that make us aware in ways that people with relatively normal bodies or typical bodies don't understand. So it's on us, in my opinion, it's our responsibility to use this disability to teach, to educate, to break down those walls that absolutely need to be broken down and are surprisingly easy to break down. Most people, when I start talking to them, relax because they're hungry for that information. It's just that I'm letting them off the hook that they don't have to be uptight about it. But in my opinion, it's our job to help them relax into that. So I just want to encourage you to, to keep that in mind. I have had this, Cameron Crowe is a movie director. He directed Almost Famous and Jerry Maguire. He's one of my favorite directors. And there's a quote by him that I've always respected which says, I'm going to paraphrase, but he says, basically, I've always been amazed that the pieces of my movies that people relate to the most are the pieces that I write from my most personal experience. So the, the components of his movie directing and writing that he doesn't make up, but that he just shares from his own personal experience, his own heart, are the parts of the movies he hears back from people that they love the most. It's because we want to know about each other. It's so easy to see once you get there. Um, but it takes guts to get past those walls that we've created. One more piece of advice and then we can move on to a new topic. But um, my mother has always been a very good professor around the concept of focusing on the things that are in your control and try, at least try, to let go of the things that are not in your control. There are things that we can control with regards to having CMT. There are things that we can't. The weakness you can't control. 
The frustration you can't fully control, but how you deal with it, you can control that. How you embrace it, how you model for other people how you embrace it, how you deal with other people's natural curiosity or fear around your CMT, that's fully in your control. I always, I wrote about it in the book, but I have always loved uh, this one quote from an ER episode. I used to love ER. And um, I'm actually going to take a drink real quick. There was this nurse named Jeannie Boulay, and she um, ended up having AIDS, HIV, and um, it was a secret for a long time in the hospital, and she didn't know what to do, and finally she came out with it. She told the staff. She went through a whole battle to keep her job. Finally, she ended up quitting. She left on her own terms, and on her last episode, she was at the front, the admin desk of the hospital, and her friends were saying goodbye to her and hugging her, and as she was walking out the doors of the hospital, one of her best friends said, Jeannie, are you going to be okay? And Jeannie turned around, and she said, you know, I'm starting to think it's not about what happens to you in this life, but how you deal with what happens to you that matters. And she turns around and walks out of the hospital, and I love that quote. I think it's at the very core of my entire belief system. We can't control that we have CMT. We've got it. So there you go. Time to get over that fact. What you can control is how you deal with it, the attitude you take around it, and the way that you carry it. That you have full control over, and don't ever, ever forget that. Uh, I received an email this week from, forwarded by Elizabeth Ouellette, um, my sweet and awesome friend, and it was from a guy named Reese Bear, I believe that's how I pronounce your last name, Reese. Um, and he had read my book and was asking a couple questions, and one of the questions that stood out to me that I wanted to address was, um, when is the right time for braces? He's relatively newly diagnosed, and he's dealing with all kinds of, of issues with his legs and feet. Um, he's asking what is the right time for braces and, and can they help and um, my absolute answer to you is the, the right time for braces is really yours to determine. Doctors were telling me since I was probably 10 years old or 12 years old that it was time to get into braces and I was telling them what they could do with that suggestion for many years after that and it wasn't until I was 23 that I finally got into my first pair of leg braces. So while it was years and years later than maybe I should have or maybe they were telling me would be best for my legs, I don't regret a day of it because I needed to be ready. So don't do it if you're not ready. Do it when you're ready to really embrace it because it's a change in life. It's a game changer. That being said, the amount of things I've accomplished since wearing braces that I never could have accomplished without them is beyond my ability to put to you. Um, I just would, would really encourage from experience that um, participating in a triathlon and finishing it riding my bike across the state of Iowa, climbing the tallest mountain in Colorado very slowly, but um, I accomplished it, is as a result of wearing leg braces and a fierce, stubborn determination. <laughs> um, without the braces, I don't do any of those things. And so um, I would say they absolutely can work. I would say that you have to have patience because your first pair may not be perfect. Um, you have to try different kinds of braces. You have to try different padding within each kind of braces. You have to be really patient and go through a lot of discomfort, but when they get it right, you find an orthotist that works well with you and that kind of feels your vibe. When they work, it, it just changes your life. It releases a weight that you don't realize you're carrying around until you really walk in braces that work for you. Um, be in touch with me, Reese, and I can talk to you a lot more about that, but the CMTA is a great resource for um, professionals that can help you in this regard. Um, Sean McHale is on the advisory board, too, and he's, he's the king. Um, so talk, talk with the CMTA, and they can help you find the right people in your area to get you started with that. Hey, Jonah, I have a, yeah. I have a question here. So along the lines of uh, braces here, we have... Um, Somebody asked about uh, what are the best brands of shoes and so forth to get. And I know I wear braces. I wear Clarks. They seem to work as my braces. You probably have a favorite pair of shoes. I was just wondering if we could do like an informal poll with everybody. If they could just let me know in the question box, because um, I don't know how to use the polling yet on this. Mm -hmm. um, what brands of shoes everybody is wearing, those of you who are out there that are wearing braces, 
be nice to get like some sort of idea of different kinds of shoes that people wear with their braces. I love it. Um, I, for a long time, was a New Balance man. I think New Balance, as as far as the popular brands, has proven, at least in my experience, to be the best and the most um, mindful of people with different feet. Um, I also, for the last year, have been wearing Dr. Comfort. Uh, they make extra depth shoes, but they actually make comfortable sneakers that are extra depth, so I've been loving on those. Uh, but I agree. Throw it out there, people. Let's let's help each other out in that regard. Um, heading towards the end, I've got about eight or nine more minutes before I'll I'll take some questions for you guys. Um, see your disability as a blessing. It's a pretty profound concept that has taken me a very long time, admittedly, to come around to. But I just want you to know that. The way I always phrase it to kids that I work with is if a genie came to me and said, I can release you from your disability, I would say no. I would say no at this point. It has given me more gifts than it has taken away from me. And that's saying a lot because it's taken a lot from me and it's been a frustrating daily battle with this thing for 44 years. That being said, if you embrace it the right way and really start living proud with it and helping to teach people through it and using it as a source of fire to accomplish things that most people think you shouldn't be able to accomplish, then it becomes a gift. I wrote a thing for the CMT newsletter a year or maybe two ago. I wanted to read it to you real quick. Let's just say I find a lamp in the woods and I pick it up and I rub the lamp and all of a sudden smoke comes out of it and a genie appears. The genie looks remarkably like Jerry Lewis. I ask him what is going on and he says to me that he has the power to take me back in time and erase my CMT. He asks me if I, I would like to see how my life would turn out without this disease. I accept his offer and with the wave of his hand and the sound of a timpani, back I go. I am standing at second plate. It is gym class, third grade, and my current self shivers from the memory of how hard gym class was to survive. The ball has hit a few feet from me. I remember this moment. I remember my teammates screaming at me to get it, and I remember not being able to move fast enough to even make the play. But in this moment, I watch my eight-year-old self dart over, scoop up the ball, and swiftly throw out the runner at first. With a wide smile, I decide I'm going to like this exercise. So I look at the genie, and I ask him to show me more. Poof, I am at summer camp, 15 years old, and I'm about to walk into the dance to see Jody Brown. And instead of tripping on the pavement and skinning my knee and being laughed at by several friends, including her, I walk gracefully into the dance and young love flourishes to open arms by journey. On the climbing, on to climbing Mount Albert, where I see my 30-year-old self climbing, in the, climbing it in seven hours flat instead of the 14 hours it really took me. And there I am competing in the triathlon. I come in 10th place instead of last place. I cross the finish line and people are clapping, but they don't have the magical inspired look in their eyes that they did when I crossed the finish line last and in leg braces. In fact, they barely see me at all. As the visions continue, the genie shows me countless mornings where I wake up and tie my shoes with ease, and the whole process takes 10 seconds. In fact, everything is happening faster, and I am noticing that I am doing things physically without appreciating them, with little to no attention. And I also notice that I am acting differently. I don't seem to have the same care for myself and for others. In fact, I seem a bit cocky, never having been made humble by the experience of weakness. And there is my girlfriend. I am 38. She, she seems to like me, but isn't in love with how I deal with my challenge, because I don't have one. We don't share the challenge together, and there is something missing because of it. I decide that I don't like this. CMT isn't so bad. It has carved me into the person I am, a physically challenged, hard-headed, frustrated, sensitive, caring, empathetic, appreciative, aware human being. I turn to the genie to scream that I want out, and poof, I awake in my bed. I look down, and there are my amazing curled-up toes. My hands are stiff. My braces are at the foot of my bed. A day of challenge is ahead of me, and a smile is on my face. I have CMT. And while it is, difficult, it is a difficult path to walk, it is an interesting and unique one as well. It takes things away and it gives important things to replace the spaces left. I get up happy to be me and I go grooving and stumbling into my day. 
as I said in this piece, there is zero doubt in my 44-year-old self's mind that the act of having CMT has made me more sensitive. It has made me able to connect to others in a way that I don't think I ever would have uh, cultivated were it not this thing that I carry around with me. It's made me humble. I think back to my youth and the younger I get, the cockier I become. The older I get, I, I'm sure there are people who are listening who know me well who are saying, are you sure you haven't? I'm not sure you've fully gotten rid of that cockiness, which is fair. <laughs> I'll give them that, but it's improved over time. Uh, humility is a gift in this world. Uh, being sensitive to others, especially others' challenges, is a gift in this world. And these gifts have been given to me by the act of having CMT. Final thoughts to share with you, and then I can uh, gladly take some questions if you have any. Um, I have a philosophy in my world and in my travels that everyone has special needs, that every single person that's walking the face of the earth has special needs, because in my world, special needs is defined as needs that are special to you. And by nature of our individuality, by nature of the fact that no two of us are born the same, we all have unique challenges. And based on those challenges, we all have unique needs. And so the concept that school, grade school teaches us that special needs is that group of kids over there but then everyone else is the normal, uh, seems misguided to me. When I go and do drumming presentations at school, sometimes I'm standing up in front of two or 300 kids, and I say, everyone has special needs. And then I, I take off my shoes and my braces, and I walk around for them, and they see how comfortable I am sharing my special needs. And next thing you know, I ask them at the end of my presentation, what are your special needs? And you'd be amazed how 90% of the hands in the room go up. Because they're starting to see, oh, I guess the fact that I read a little slower is a special need. I guess the fact that I'm an only child creates for me special needs. Um, I guess the fact that I'm tall, that I'm short, that I'm African American, that I am from another country, that I fall down and trip sometimes, that I have foot pain, that I have leg braces, any of these things are special needs. And so don't believe for a second that you are different than others. Maybe your special needs are a little easier to see, but I've come to see in my travels that sometimes the biggest special needs are the ones that you can't see. So look at every single person the same way you wish people would look at you and trust that there are things inside of them that they could use a little understanding around and maybe asking them, how you doing? Everything cool? Uh, in the same way that it might be nice if more people said, how are you doing? Can I help? Anything you need support with? Um, everyone has special needs. Piece number two, go outside your comfort zone. I believe that everyone has this circle around them, and I call that the comfort zone. And inside the circle is everything that's tested, everything that's comfortable, everything that you've already been through and you know is safe you know is going to be all right. That's what's inside the circle. And I can tell you, at least at the age of 44, that arguably the majority, almost all of the best things that have happened to me in my life have come to me when I go outside the boundary of that comfort zone, when I step outside the circle. Now, getting out of that circle is pretty awkward. It's uncomfortable. It's nerve-wracking. Sometimes it's anxiety-ridden, like you absolutely don't want to do it. And I guess my long-winded point is do it anyway. When it comes to sharing with other people about your challenges, when it comes to teaching people who are looking at you strange, just walking up to them and saying, do you want to know why I wear these? Get past the discomfort because the reward is so profoundly bigger than the challenge every single time. I promise you that I wouldn't be in Colorado right now. I wouldn't be married to Megan right now. I wouldn't have most of the greatest things in my life right now if I stayed always inside my comfort zone. Now that looks different for everyone. Maybe your definition of going outside your comfort zone is a tiny little step. Maybe the other person's definition of going outside their comfort zone is a huge step. The size of the step does not matter to me. It's the fact that you take a step outside of it. Um, Define for you where your comfort level is right now, and in the coming days or week, maybe step outside of it. Share your disability in a way that you haven't in the past. Um, that's my two cents. The last thing I will say to you is a quote from the movie A Beautiful Mind uh, with 
Russell Crowe, and I love that movie. And at the near the end of the movie, he says um, the following quote: "Maybe that's the way of it." That, Oh, how does he? I'll have to paraphrase, but maybe that's the way of our dreams and our nightmares. You have to feed them to keep them alive, and that's such an interesting concept that you get to choose which you feed. You get to choose if this disability is miserable, is taxing, is just purely negative, or you get to choose if this disability is a challenge that you can accept is an opportunity for you to teach other people, is an invitation to greatness that you wouldn't have achieved if you didn't have this challenge. You choose which one to feed, and I promise you, the more you feed the positive, the easier it gets to live the positive. Um, I will read you a small poem, very short poem, that I wrote for the last time I spoke at a conference, um, and then I'd be happy to take your questions. It's called The Waves. The waves come crashing on the sand. What shall we do? Run for dry land? Or take the chances and lift our feet and ride the tide our fortunes to meet? We wake up each and every day to work and plan and dream and play and strive not to trip or stumble or fall, our pride intact, our confidence tall. But the truth comes shining through, you see. We have challenge to face. We have CMT. Our feet are funky, our balance unsure, our weakened hands are reaching for a cure. And while we wait for the cure to arrive, we must challenge our fears, we must constantly strive to teach those around us the way we, with the way we face this challenge with strength and truth and grace. Try not to be normal, seek not who to blame, don't add to the weight of your feet with your shame. Walk your own way, stumble with style, do more than survive this. Thrive this and smile. Go beyond the boundary where your comfort ends. You'll be strengthened by the wisdom it lends. And when the waves come crashing, do your best to be brave. Lift your feet and ride the wave. Thank you so much for sitting and listening to me for 45 minutes. It's, it's a real just pleasure and joy to share this time with you. And, Please trust that I'm easy to find through the CMTA and through Facebook, so anytime anybody wants to chat or needs a dose of positivity or wants to share a dose with me, um, come and find me, and I would be more than happy to take any questions if there are any. John, uh, thank you very much. I would, uh, wow, 849, I didn't think you could uh, <laughs> that long. That was great. I really enjoyed it. Um, we do have a, a couple of questions here, and I'll start off with uh, with this one. I, I think it's kind of in tune with the holidays right now. Is for somebody who's newly diagnosed, how do you how do you break the ice and talk to family and or friends you're going to see over the holidays with this uh, new diagnosis of what uh, what you have here with uh, Charcot Marie Hmm. Um. Well, I will share with you my take on the approach, but I'm also a little little bit of an extrovert, a lot bit of an extrovert. So my style is usually one fell swoop. If I have big news to share, I like to get people together, sit them down, and really talk it through with them. So if that's the kind of family that you're a part of, if that's of comfort level to you, I would completely suggest when everyone's around the table or everyone's sitting in the living room relaxing, just to grab everyone's attention and say, look, I, there's been some updates with me and, and really present it in a positive way. You're not breaking terrible news to them. You are informing them of a change that's happened with you and um, you're doing the very thing I've been talking about for the last hour, which is arming them with the information they need to be sympathetic to you and to be supportive to you. Um, you set the tone. If you get up in front of your family or even if you do it one by one, one at a time, uh, if you get in front of your family and say, oh, God, guys, I have to break this terrible news to you, then I promise you that's how they'll take it. If you get up in front of them and say, okay, so guess what? I have a disability. It's called Charcot Marie Tooth, and here's how it works. Um, I promise you that people will always surprise you with the way they take it. And for those few people who don't take it well, who take it with immaturity, who show uh, that they put more distance in the way, those are people that you don't need to focus as much attention on, or maybe those are people that need a little bit more information in order to get it. But I say go right to it. Um, you can also use 
the CMTA. I mean, the website is amazing. There's all sorts of resources that they have to give out. There's a brand new book out there that's amazing. Um, there are eight-year-old books called He Walks Like a Cowboy that I'm just throwing it out there as an impartial person you could easily use to educate the people in your lives. Um, there's lots of resources, and whoever asked that question, feel free to find me on Facebook, and I would love to chat with you more about that. Cool. Um, also, here's, here's another one. This is interesting. Um, um, how do you respond to people who, I guess this person is wearing uh, shorts at some point, uh, not right now in New Jersey, of course, but yeah. somewhere. <laughs> Um, and getting over the visual of the braces, you know, they're happy that the braces bring them all this new mobility and, and uh, strength. But um, to people who look at them and say, wow, you look fine, um, what's up? Hmm. Interesting. I, you know, I write about it in the book that when I first got braces, I wore jeans all the time. And I mean all the time in 95 degree humid Maryland summer weather, I'd be in long, long pants. Um, and it's just interesting to look back on that time because what was I doing? I was sweating because of pride. Um, I had a friend named Tara who challenged me that summer. I worked with her. Uh, it was, I think, 2001. She said, hey, how come you never wear shorts? And I said, to be honest, I'm a little uncomfortable about my braces. She said, if I were you, I'd give it a try. And I said, all right, so the next day I wore shorts. And I will be blunt and honest with you, it was uncomfortable. I did not like the feeling of walking around and um, being so exposed. I didn't like it at all. And I can also tell you that the next time I wore shorts, which was probably a few weeks later, it was a touch less uncomfortable. And I can then tell you that decades later, two decades later, um, I wear shorts without blinking now. And so I guess my, my answer to your question is that there is no quick fix to that. You have to go through the discomfort. You have to go through the adjustment of what it is to have people see a difference with you. It draws attention to you. I happen to love attention. There's a lot of people out there that do not like attention, but um, bottom line is, you got it, so deal with it. And when people look at you, try your best to smile at them. Don't make a, f a face. Don't shame them for looking. In fact, anytime you're able, uh, grab the moment and say, do you want to know why I wear these and follow suit. All right. Um, well, that's, uh, that's all the questions we have right now. I think the, uh, the clear winner in, this, in the footwear category was New Balance. Uh, not that that's any scientific poll or anything here, but we did get a bunch of people who said they wear New Balance. And some of the Atrix uh, lines, too. Well, somebody just came in with the Merrill Hikers. So, you know what? Um, like myself, I, as I mentioned earlier, I wear these Clark kind of boating shoes. I think everybody's going to find, and if you go in my closet, you'll find 15 pairs of unused shoes. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to find shoes that work for you and don't work for you. Um, having said all that, John, I want to say thank you very much for a very interesting talk. And I Real give pleasure. You give you the floor to close it out with any thoughts, or final thoughts you have. Everybody, if you were listening, sounds like Joan is more than open to answering questions if you just want to email him um, and uh, get in touch with him through the CMTA. And we really appreciate that. And uh, John, I'll let you finish it up and then we'll take it out. Sounds good. Well, much, much love to all of you. The happiest of holidays. Um, best of luck with this challenge. It is not easy. There are days where I throw my brace against the wall at the end of the day and scream a word I won't say here. Um, I don't 24-7 deal with it in such a positive way, but all I can say is use those moments. Be frustrated. Throw your brace against the wall from time to time, and then get up and keep on trying to be positive. Uh, there is a lot of love and acceptance out there, but you have to tap into it. It doesn't come automatically. Um, my email is bluewoodfire at hotmail.com, B-L-U-E-W-O-O-D-F-I-R-E at hotmail.com. Please feel free to email me at any time. Um, my book is He Walks Like a Cowboy, uh, available on Amazon.com, relatively inexpensive. And um, 
I just am in your corner, and any way that I can be to help you out, I would be more than delighted to. So please don't be shy. Reach out anytime, and I love to make those connections. Um, much love. Much love to all of you. Best of luck, and happy holidays.